What's good, everyone? Welcome to the Truth Podcast. I am your host, Anthony Benitez. And man, today's going to be an awesome episode. I'm really excited for today's episode. And I really want you guys to have your, your expectation out. You know, when you listen to the audio podcast or even if you check out our YouTube channel, which I highly, highly encourage you. So now you can match my face with the voice and it's more entertaining to look at a screen than sometimes to just the audio. So go check out the YouTube channel. It's truth underscore M-I-N on YouTube. Go check it out. Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, leave a comment, tell me your blood type, what's your favorite type of ice cream, <laughs> whatever it is. I want to know who you are on the other side of this screen, this mic. So like I was saying before I interrupted myself. It's important to understand that when you're listening to the Word of God, even if you're listening driving, even if you're listening, you know, you're taking a shower or you're working out or whatever it is, I've literally had people tell me, and you know who you are, that as they're listening to me on the other end, and it's Jesus in me, so just relax, cool down, religious man. As they listen to me on the other end, the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus is ministering to them and you, I have people tell me, hey, I'm working out and I feel the love of God. I feel the presence of Jesus, who is God in the flesh. I feel the Lord and the Lord is pouring out his love, his healing, his power. It's very interesting because you have to understand in Christianity, we think, you know, when we talk about the Lord's power, though it does manifest and it manifested in the Old Testament with fire from heaven and all this stuff, his power is his love. His love. I cannot tell you how many times I've been flustered, I've been frustrated with myself, with situations. And, and you know, at that time, I don't need, and you and I, we don't need, you know, five shooting stars to pass our way. We don't need, you know, a volcano to erupt in front of our face to realize that God is there for us. You know what we need? We need the Holy Spirit's embrace. The Lord Je the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. The Lord Jesus, His embrace. You know, in the Gospels, the two prodigal sons, when the rebellious son was coming back, the Bible says the father saw him and he ran to him and he embraced him. He fell on him. He kissed him. He hugged him. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, when the disciples, listen to this, when they were sitting down, that is when the Holy Spirit filled them. In comparison to the Old Testament, when they were standing up, the children of Israel, they were servants. They were standing at the foot of Mount Sinai and God gave the law. But in the New Testament, children of God, they were sitting down and the Holy Spirit filled them all. Standing versus sitting. New Testament versus Old Testament. So why am I saying these things? You know, a lot of times when, when, we're, when we're kind of flustered with life, you know, uh, we have a tough week or whatever it is. You don't need some crazy religious guy sweating his tail off to yell at you or even to pump you up like a cheerleader. You know what you need? You need the Lord's love and embrace. You need his, 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 I can't explain it. It's his love. It's like a little child that just is yearning for the father's embrace. And that is what we all crave Every single human being, Christian and non-Christian, all we crave for is acceptance. And we do funny, funny things to try to be accepted. We try to be accepted even in Christianity. We try to be accepted in religious circles, you know. And a lot of times I've seen pastors that I've known that were, that, they were cool guys, you know, at the previous church. Shout out to you. And, you know, I think he knew to an extent a specific truth regarding grace and how the old covenant has been put aside. But yet he was too afraid to be alone and to stand out of the crowd. So you crave acceptance. But you see, man will always let you down. 
heck, me on the other side of this mic, I may let you down, listener, but you know who will never let you down is the Lord Jesus. And our acceptance, I want to tell you this, our acceptance comes from understanding who he is, how much he loves, how much he loves us, his love for us, what he has done for us. So this craving for acceptance, we see it all throughout society. We see it in Christianity. And a lot of times if we try to fill this void of acceptance because the Lord puts it there because that, you know, there's like a honing device for us to seek out the Lord. And a lot of times we end up being distracted and, you know, doing funny, funny things like I'm saying to try to be accepted. But in reality is you're never going to find your acceptance and your security in any other thing or any other person, I should say, you won't find your security in, in anything else, any other person other than the Lord Jesus. You can't even find your security in your husband. You can't find your security in your wife. You can't find your security in your children. So when children leave the nest, the parents go back crazy because it's like, you know, in, subconsciously they were finding their identity in children. You get laid off from work. I'm, I'm being hypothetical, so just chill out. You get laid off from work and then people end up committing suicide. Why? Because their identity was stemmed in, I'm an engineer. Nothing wrong with being an engineer. I'm just pointing a point, I'm proving a point here. You know, people go to the NFL. They've been playing sports their entire life. They pull a hamstring. They're out for a season. Then they get cut and then they go crazy. Why? Because it, you know what this is? This is an identity crisis. It's, it's we need to realize that this craving for acceptance, even as a Christian, is only found in a person, and his name is Jesus. And when we realize, I'm telling you, you, you this, is, this is where you want to be. Unshakable, according, uh, as far as man's opinions go. Unresponsive, unbalking to what they have to say about you. Even your own spouse, even your own parents, even your own family, you want to get to that point. And it's not being callous, but it's being secure in Christ. So it doesn't matter what your uncle says. It doesn't matter what your ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend, your spouse, your husband, your wife, your kids, your grandmother, you know, your tia fulanita. It doesn't matter what they say. Because why? Because you have understood and you've seen how much the Lord Jesus loves you, how much you have been accepted, how much you have been forgiven, how much he went to the cross. The Bible says, he who knew no sin, he became sin. Why? So that we, be, so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. He gave you his righteousness. He became your sin. He became sin. He became a curse. He, be, he took on that mental torment. He took on the punishment for that abortion. He took on the punishment for that witchcraft and drug addiction. He took on every punishment. Why? Because you see, the value of a thing is, is always found in how much a person is willing to pay for it. You know, Chloe, Dior, Saint Laurent, Louis Vuitton, Montclair, all these, all these name brands. Yes, there's quality to it, but ultimately it's the consumer who deep, who pushes the price of that commodity how much are people willing to pay for it at the end of the day it's just a tangible good but how much people are willing to spend shows you how much it's valued man we were watching this movie and it's a great movie i bring it up probably like every other episode go in, in other words go watch it in moneyball it was about this gm his security was found in in him being a baseball player and he, he was a fluke. So even now as a GM, he still walked around with the chip on his shoulder. And that may be you today. You may be walking around with the chip on your shoulder subconsciously. Always trying to prove to me, trying to prove to your parents, trying to prove to society, trying to prove to your classmates who you really are. So this GM in this movie, Moneyball, played by Brad Pitt, director uh, Bennett Miller, phenomenal, uh, the the. The, freak, the freaking movie is amazing. So 
this GM was so insecure and he walked around with the chip on his shoulder all throughout his entire life that even when he was offered the biggest contract, $13 million for a GM in a year, in a single year, annually, 13 mil. This was a record. He, the highest paid GM in sports history. And he couldn't receive it. Why? Because we all yearn for this acceptance, for this identity. And friend, no, no amount of money, career success, title, children, spouse, good looks, bad looks, mediocre looks. No amount of these things. Are, are all these things bad? No. It's not bad to be good looking. It's not bad to have children. It's not bad to, have be, to, be, to be successful in your career. It's not bad to be to want to move up to executive VP. It's not bad. But my question today in the beginning of this broadcast is what are we placing our value on, on our acceptance? Who are we looking to to be accepted? Are we looking to society? Are we looking to our family? Are we looking to ourselves? Are we trying to prove a point here? But in reality, it's nothing that we have to prove. But in reality, is understanding the proof that Jesus has provided for you and I to see and realize and understand. And in the midst and in that understanding, that revelation, that understanding who God is for you, how much he loves you. Because, you know, the Lord Jesus, this is an intimate relationship. It's not, it's not so cookie cutter. I would even beg to share. It's not so cookie cutter. The way that he talks to me is not the way that he'll talk to my wife, not the way that he'll talk to you, perhaps. But a lot of the times when I jump on this mic and I make some ridiculous illustrations, the Lord is ministering. And that's the beauty of his omnipotence, his sovereignty. So I want to begin this episode with, I want you to realize how much accepted you are in the Lord. How loved you are in Christ. How much, you see, I, I was driving this morning on the 405. And maybe that's why the Lord has me on this before we jump into the meat and potatoes. But I, I was driving and, you know, you have to realize that the Lord has selected Israel. You, you can't be deceived in these end times. You must be on the right side of history you, because then you're going to end up like a buffoon in Christianity and making books against Israel without even knowing, being very anti-Semitic. And you have to realize the apple of God's eye is Israel. They're elected by grace, just like you and I are elected by grace. Well, Israel is elected by grace. They're loved by the Lord. Israel is, is loved. Okay? He will protect them and he will save them. So... In the natural, the natural seed of Abraham, there's a there's a, an anointing on the Jewish people to make a lot of money, to be separated, to be successful. My wife and I were watching some of the Oscars the other day, and it's like I told her, I said, "Do you realize that the, the majority of Hollywood is uh, a lot of Jewish people are." producers they're in pre-production post-production they own the studios they fund the movies they have it's the majority of the bts the behind the scenes they the jewish people run the majority of hollywood say what you say about hollywood but i'm i'm proving a point here is that the jewish people are so loved in the lord's eyes because jesus came as a jew realize that jesus is jewish do you realize that you know, Messiah is in the Jewish culture. So realize that and let the Lord help you with that. So the Jewish people, they're prized in the eyes of the Lord, not by their works, but by grace, just like you and I. And when you see the Jewish people, they're set apart. You know, they're they're blessed financially. Say what you say about them, but they're, they're, they have a soft spark soft spot in the Lord's heart and they're blessed, they're anointed and they're called. Some of them are, are saved, some of them are not. But either way, the Lord loves them very dearly. Why am I saying that? Because as I was driving to the four, uh, through, to the four or five this morning, the Lord began to kind of show me how much more you and I as Christians, how much more you and I as sons of God, we're not servants. 
You know, we're not uh, making sacrifices with natural lambs. We have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. We are in the beloved. We are in Christ Jesus. When the Lord sees us, he sees Jesus. How much more set apart anointed, blessed, favored, and loved shall you and I have this consciousness when we walk through every single day life. You know, when you go to work, you should stand out, not as a prick, but you should stand out with the joy of the Lord, with a smile, with, with and not this fake stuff, but just it's just emanating through you. And it's not because you're trying, but because of who God is in you, who Christ is is in you so i want to end the intro with this is that you know our acceptance is always going to come back to our reality in christ we are a holy nation a royal priesthood you have royal blood running through your veins whether you believe it or not in your veins is the royal blood of god himself the bible says and the two shall be one flesh talking about christ and you you and christ are one flesh naturally it's reckoned according to faith but you have the blood of god running through your veins your body is the temple of god almighty your body is one flesh with jesus reckoned by faith you have the mind of christ the bible says first corinthians he who is joined to the lord has become one spirit with him you are so united to the lord jesus <laughs> That you is him and him is you, if you can understand that. So this is how the Lord God sees you. He doesn't separate you from his son. He doesn't see you in your sin. He, do he doesn't see you in your bad temper. He does not see you in your frustrations. He sees you in Christ. You know, so when we realize this, this is, this is what brings your identity and then all this shakiness from, you know, broken relationships, past jobs, careers going different ways, uh, just friendships breaking up, whatever it is that, the, that life may throw at you, whatever it is, you won't be shaking. Why? Because your life has been built upon the rock of who Christ is in you. So let's go to Joshua chapter 1. I want to talk today about this promised land. I'm going to be referencing Joshua chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 3. And he, Hebrews chapter 3 is referencing the uh, Canaan land, the promised land. You see, in the Old Testament, to give you a recap, Moses kept begging God. Moses was like, you know, let me go into the promised land. Let me take the children of Israel into the promised land. Now, we have to pause and realize that Moses is a type of what? He, he represents what? Moses represents the law. John chapter 1 verse 17 says that through Moses was the law given, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So Moses represents the law. So in the Old Testament, Mo uh, Moses kept begging God, let me take the children into the promised land. Let me take your children into the promised land to the point where God said, nope. And then he said, and stop asking me. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because you have to understand Moses represents the law for you and I practically on this side of in the New Testament. We have to realize that the law, you see, many, many times we try to go into the promised land. And what's inside the promised land? What's inside Canaan land? Well, the Bible says in Deuteronomy that you will live in houses you did not build. You will drink from lands you did not, or you will drink from wells you did not dig. You will eat from vineyards you did not plant. What is this talking about? Remember, symbolism, typology is big. I, I'm going to pause here. I think it's very interesting because I was listening to this album by J. Cole. I'm not going to say what, but I was listening to this album and it's like, you know, every single, every, everybody in the world, you look at the Da Vinci Code, you look, like everybody in the world believes in typology and symbolism and there's more to, there's more meaning than just literal stuff. But why don't religious Christians 
that religious Christians are the only ones that are like, no, we just got to eat it literally. Okay, well then, <laughs> Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, the Jewish the Jewish people back in the day said, well, this guy is, is saying, is, is, uh, he's saying we should eat his literal body, cannibalism. You see, so in the same exact manner, when you're dull of hearing, when your eyes are blind spiritually, you, you can't see past the literal meaning. There's a deeper meaning to what even what I'm saying that you have to ask the Lord. That's the humility. You have to ask the Lord to help you. You know, and but I want to tell you that that the word of God is full of symbolism and typology. And you know what? It makes the Bible so much fun. It, it may it's like you we, we 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 crave this stuff when we watch DC films, whatever it is. But in reality it's like man when you when you begin to drink the wine of the typology and the symbolism, it becomes so riveting and intoxicating. You begin to, it, it, it fills your soul. So Moses represents the law. So he kept begging God saying, hey, let me take these children, your children, into, or the children of Israel, I should say, they weren't his children, they were his servants. But the children of Israel is what the Bible calls them. Let me take the children of Israel into the promised land, which speaks of grace, houses that they did not work for. They would drink from wells they did not dig. That's work. They would eat from vineyards they did not plant. That's work. So this is all talking about what? This is talking about the promised land in the Old Testament is a type of the rest R-E-S-T, the rest of God, the land which belongs to you and I spiritually. So that is a natural type. And the spiritual reality, the substance, is the promised land for you and I today is a land of rest for your soul, for your mind, for your body. So Moses was begging God, let me take them into the promised land. And he kept begging him and begging him until God said, stop asking me. Why was he so harsh? Because the law will never bring you and I into the promised land, into the blessing. Something practical. Let's say you're trying so hard to make money. Let's say you're trying so hard to be rich. Subconsciously, you have a understanding to an extent that you, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Subconsciously, you know, you have some sort of understanding that the Bible says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he became poor so that you and I could become rich. Okay. But in reality, you we still try, we still rely on our flesh. You can say no, 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 but the fruit is there or the lack of it. So that, you know, when the rubber meets the road, ultimately is are you victorious in these areas in your life i don't care how much you know i don't even care how much i know because i because i'll be honest with you a lot of the times no matter what i know sometimes i'll still bang my head on the wall and then until i like sit confounded and be like wow okay just chill sit still so in reality though you may have an understanding to an extent that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He became poor so you can become rich. But yet we're still trusting in our flesh. We're still trusting in our intelligence. We're trying too hard. And it's very hard to explain these things because it's like, I'm not telling you to quit your job and do nothing, but I am telling you to do nothing while you do something. I'm not telling you to quit your job and do nothing, but I am telling you to do nothing while doing something. And that is spiritual, a spiritual reality. I'm talking internally here. And the way the acid test is very easy is what is the fruit? The, the works of the flesh are these. Anxiety, strife, sedition, hatred, anger, wrath. Everything of the flesh, everything that is that is of the flesh is, you know, it brings death and, and all this stuff. So that's a good temperature check. All right. So though I may know it in my noggin, the, I'm still in these in this anxious toil. So that means I know it in my noggin, but it hasn't dropped into my heart. 
So then we try to be rich. It's like, you know, no, I know I, I'm, I've been blessed, but let me add my two cents. Let me do something. Let me worry about it. Let me, you know, stress and toil and read books. And there's nothing wrong with reading books. There's nothing wrong with working hard. But in reality is what are you putting your trust in? Again, this is, this is, these are spiritual meats for the mature. I'm not telling you to do nothing. I'm t uh, to quit your job and do nothing like the movie Office Space. And just wear a Hawaiian shirt and just like, you know, say, what's up, man? And everything's chill. And just like, just do nothing until they kick you out of wherever you're at. No, but I am saying do something physically, but do nothing internally. This is called the walk of faith. And the mature children do, do, let me ask you a question. Do babies walk? I'm talking about toddlers, like infants. Do infants and babies walk? Well, you know, I think technically at the age of two and a half. Okay, do infants, do little babies walk? No, they don't. As they grow, though, they learn to walk. They learn to walk. They learn to run. And they learn. And then even as you grow deeper then, or older, I should say, you learn to walk by yourself instead of your mom and dad holding your hand as a little child. Then you start to walk and then you start to run, then you start to play games, play sports, all this stuff. In the same exact way, what I'm talking about, about doing something physically, but doing nothing spiritually within you, this is a walk of faith that I can try to explain to you, but the Lord Jesus himself will teach you. But a key indicator is what the Lord has given to us according to his word. The works of the flesh are these. So if we're feeling anxiousness, clammy hands, stress, anxiety, uh, everything. You know, before I got saved, I, I would go to the doctor because my freaking sinuses were always clogged up. Little did I know that that is a phenomenon of being under the law. You know, because when you're free, when you're under grace internally, you, you breathe deep, you have oxygen flowing through your nostrils, you know, you're, you're cool, calm, collective, which is what the world, I mean, every human being would love to be cool, calm, and collective, like James Dean. Every every human being would want to be that. And, re, and the reality, the substance of it is called grace, is is not, it's not necessarily quitting your job and being a hermit or, you know, being like the Amish, which shout out to the Amish, but it's, it's, it's being involved in society and dealing with the pressures of life, the, the, the stresses of life, but they don't stress you out. The pressures of life, but they don't pressure you out. The uh, problems of life, but they're not problems to you. The frustrations of life, but you bring the solution, all these things. So it's like, it's not living a hermit life, but it's, it's rather being involved in society and learning to deal with your problems from a position of rest, which is called the promised land. So Moses said, I need to bring these people in. He said, no, you cannot. Now stop asking me. Why? Because the law works will never bring you into the blessing, into the promised land. The Bible says in Romans, they that are of faith, are blessed and in every area health wealth mind body relationships business success ministry whatever it is to be blessed you must be a son of abraham there's a difference between the children of abraham the israeli nation and sons of abraham which talks about all throughout the Gospels, those who were righteous by faith. And only the sons are able to drive the Maserati. Only the sons are able to inherit the business from the father. Only the sons are capable of running the father's responsibilities and duties. Not as, not as a servant, but as a king. So in the same exact manner, this promised land in the Old Testament, the reality, the substance of it, I remember when I first heard this last year, like in June, I was parked, listen to this, I was parked on a hill in the valley and I was listening to Joseph Prince and he was ha having an interview with, I believe, someone on TBM and he said this, he, he said exactly what I'm talking about. He said, well, in the Old Testament, Canaan land, the promised land is the substance of it for you and I as believers, he said, is rest within and out of that out of that rest is where every single blessing comes out of the rest you see the holy spirit is uh, is 
is is a signified as a dove. He is not a dove, but he's signified as a dove. And a dove is a peaceful bird. It's a calm bird. So the anointing flows where there is peace, stillness, and calmness. The anointing cannot flow where there is fearfulness and anxiety and doubt. But the anointing flows where there is rest because faith is a rest. So in the same exact manner, when I heard uh, Joseph Prince talk about how the promised land in the Old Testament is the land of rest for us as believers, I was, I was baffled. I was like, what? And I knew this is where the Lord was taking me to. Because at that time, every single night, I would battle with freaking panic attacks. Why? Because I kept trying to put myself to sleep. I kept thinking about it too much. I kept trying internally. I was so obsessed with it. I was so, I, I, that's putting myself under the law. And because I put myself under the law, I cannot tell you how many horrible nights I've had uh, in the past, but then something clicked that I, honestly, friend, I can't even tell you when it happened. But months and months and months and months ago, just maybe like 10 months ago, I just said, F it. Sorry if that offends you, but I said, screw it. I said, I'm done. I said, I, I, I can't do it. I, and I don't, I don't even think about it nowadays. I just, I just let go. And then it's just like, I, I fall asleep like a baby versus before I would be so conscious of the problem of, I'll be so conscious of trying to find the solution. I'd be so obsessed with it that it would freaking drive me crazy and to the point where I would have anxiety and panic attacks throughout the night. And then it, w it wasn't until I finally gave up. And I was talking to my wife about this earlier. In the reality, it's like, it, you know, if you would ask me how, how, to, how, to, how to learn how to rest, my answer would be like, honestly, is your head getting banged on the... It doesn't have to be this way, but the majority, because of our flesh, because of our stubbornness of, as humanity, the majority of the time would be, hey, us banging our head to the wall multiple, multiple, multiple times and realizing in us dwells no good thing. Because you can say that, but you can still have confidence subconsciously within you. And it, it isn't until you crash and burn internally and you realize hey i can't do anything and it is in that you know what that is called that's called the breaking of self-confidence where is that in the bible anthony a type is in the old testament with gideon gideon the way that he delivered the nation of israel at that time was he had a light a lamp a light and then he had a earthen jar around the light and what he was told to do by god was to break the earthen vessel so that the light could shine forth and when the earthen vessel was broken then the light shine shone forth and the Midianites ended up killing each other and their enemies were destroyed with 300 men destroyed thousands upon hundreds of thousands of Persian armies and many other armies how by breaking the earthen vessel the light came forth this is called the breaking of self-confidence, the breaking of the flesh, the breaking. The Bible says we have in Second Corinthians, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So in the same exact manner that Gideon broke the earthen vessel so that the light could shine through, the majority of the time our self-confidence must be broken. Our reliance on our resume, our reliance on our good looks, on our reliance on how much we bench, our reliance on who we know you know, our connections in society, our reliance on, you know, my dad was a pastor in, you know, uh, you know, Connecticut, New Jersey, whatever, I don't know, whatever town you're from, our reliance on all these little things, our reliance on our identity in our children, our identity in, in, our, in our society as a good mom, all of these things, you know, when you're called, there's a higher calling upon your life and that earthen vessel needs to be shattered. I'm not talking about, and I'm not going to explain it. I'm not going to say this every single time because if you know me, you know what I teach. I'm not talking about sickness or death, friend. I'm not even talking about car accidents because that's unbiblical. That's not biblical. But I am talking about a broken ego. I'm talking about humility. And I cannot tell you how many times I... I began to realize this. And this is why Paul said, I rejoice in my sufferings. This is why James says, brethren, rejoice in the manifold temptations that have come upon you. This is why First Peter said, hey, don't be bewildered at these sufferings that have come upon you to test you. 
This is why Paul said, I rejoice in my infirmities and my weakness, for when I am weak, then am I strong. All of these, the, see, this is the ways of grace. And when we realize this, then we begin to humble ourselves. So the, the blessing on this side of heaven is called rest. Hebrews chapter 3 says this. Verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Let me put the new King James on. Verse 7. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 says this, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. How did they rebel? Let's see. In the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers tempted me, tested me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation. And I said, they do always go astray in their heart. And they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath that they shall never enter my rest. This is talking, this is come, this is taken out of the Old Testament. This is taken out of the Old Testament. Paul, who I think the who many Bible teachers believe is the writer of Hebrews, he's quoting from the Old Testament. He's talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness, in the the Bible calls it the rebellion, where they tempted and tested God. Well, if you go to Acts chapter 15, Peter by the Spirit spoke up in the council of Jerusalem when the when there was many religious people trying to enslave new believers to obey the law of Moses. Peter by the Spirit spoke up and said, Why do you tempt God? Why are you testing God? Why are you tempting God? How? By sinning? No, no, no. What does it say? Why do you tempt God by trying to put a burden, a yoke on these believers, which yoke we or our fathers, talking about the nation of Israel, we were never able to bear. But we believe, verse 11, Acts 15, verse 11, but we believe that it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the same exact manner, this yoke, this rebellion, this this tempting, this tempting God, you know, to put ourselves back under the law, to try to work for God, is tempting God. To try to work for the blessing is called tempting God. Why do you tempt God? By trying to put yourself back under the law. Why are you tempting God? Why are you testing God? Do, the Bible says you're hardening your hearts. It's the rebellion. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tempted me and tried me. And they saw my works. So I was angry with that generation. Why? Because they do always error in their heart, the Bible says, and they have not known my ways. So I swore that they shall never enter my rest. In the Old Testament that this is quoted from, the Bible doesn't say they shall not enter my rest. The Bible says in the Old Testament where this is quoted from, listen to this. The Bible says they shall not enter my promised land. They shall not enter the promised land. And here in the New Testament, Paul by the Spirit said that promised land is called my rest. So in the Old Testament where he's quoting this from, the Bible says that God said they will never enter into the promised land. Why? Because they tempted me saying that they can keep the law. So they tempted me and I was angry with them. They hardened their hearts. So I swore they would never go into the promised land. We're to the point where God had to wait for that generation to die for a new generation with Joshua, which is a type of Jesus, to enter into the land of rest. The Bible says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Moses, the law is dead. Now you, Joshua, Jesus, you, grace, you, Yeshua, you go into the promised land. How? By grace. Everything is by grace. Moses can never get, enter into the promised land. No matter how many times he begged God, you can never receive your blessing by working internally. He begged God and God said, shut up. He, he said, shut up. I'm paraphrasing here. He said, shut up. Enough is enough. Stop. You're not going to go. I said, no. I'm paraphrasing here, so relax. 
but uh, I believe God has a nice personality. He's had, you know, I, I think uh, he would say something like that. So he said, no, enough is enough. Stop asking me. I've said what I said. You cannot go into the promised land. Why? Because the law cannot receive the blessing. But, yes, but Yeshua, Joshua, uh, which means uh, saving grace, grace can enter in. Grace is the only way to receive the blessing. Grace is the only way to receive the promised land. That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 4 and 5, Therefore it is of faith, rest, that it might be by grace that the promise may be effective to all the seed. The promise, the blessing of Abraham becomes effective when it is of faith resting by grace. By receiving it because it's already done. So, I want to end here. What is this promise then for you today? Because I want to make this practical for you. Because this promise and this blessing is is a substance it is a reality for you and i this promised land is a sound mind riches health wealth i don't care if you like it or not but that's what the bible says it is health it is wealth it is youthfulness it is a, it is always being exempt from sickness from catastrophe is being blessed shalom all around wholeness in your mind in your soul in your body strong youth uh vigorous successful poised cool calm collective family strong children blessed anointed house beautiful cars multiple gold lots of it business success uh children going to whatever school you want no hindrances eating the best food caviar whatever it is whatever you see that that is mine this that's that's where my faith is at but some people, it's like you. We, we think we're too humble to be like, well, God, can you bless me with riches? But in reality, you're being prideful. Because if God paid for it by the blood of Christ, who are you to deny the finished work of the cross? If God is satisfied with the finished work of Jesus, question, are you satisfied with the work of Jesus? Are you satisfied with the finished work of the cross? God is. Are you? Are you greater than God? Why are you tempting God? Why not simply humble yourself and receive it by faith through grace? Why not receive everything he has for you? Why not receive the success, the blessing, the riches, the health, the wealth, the, the if you like it, if you can take it, the fame, the influence, the beauty, the everything. Why? Why, why, why not why not be a trophy of God's grace upon your society? Why not be a trophy of the Lord's uh, mercifulness, not even mercifulness, His grace, His graciousness to your sphere of influence? Why settle? Because it's pride. But in reality, is it's already finished. The Bible says, if you read, which I encourage you to read Hebrews chapter 3, the Bible calls this, this is, this is the land of rest. And they could not enter in because of unbelief. So unbelief would drive you to work. Unbelief would drive you to work. The Bible says, so we see that they could not enter in. Why? Because of sin? Does it say that? No. Verse 19, Hebrews 3 says, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief will drive you to work. And when you drive the works of the flesh, there will be sin. There will be adultery. There will be fornication, sex, drugs, rock and roll, whatever you want to call it. But it first starts with unbelief, refusing the grace of God, refusing to enter into the promised land, refusing to enter into a finished work. So then you put yourself under the law. And the Bible says anyone who touches this mountain will be thrust through will be thrust through with a dart a fiery dart so when we put our hearts under the law it's no wonder that we feel anxious it's no wonder that our hands get clammy it's no wonder that we feel weak and tired and depressed and and angry all the time why because we subconsciously have put ourselves under the law and hebrews chapter 12 and 13 says anyone who touches the law the mount sinai will be thrust through with a fiery dart even if a beast touches the mountain it is commanded for the animal to be thrust through with a dart now when we put ourselves under the law god is not condemning us but we're we by ourselves are in pride and we are in unbelief so we're working and as such the works of the flesh are these them that are of the works are under the curse 
So immediately, you don't even have to do anything. Immediately, the minute that we believe, the moment that we believe wrong, we're under the curse. So a Christian can be in and out of the in and out of blessing, curse, blessing, curse, blessing, curse, blessing, curse, blessing, curse. How? Because one minute at work you can just be restful. And then you come home and you try to parent your, your children, but you immediately when you pull into the garage, your your heart is tense, so then you're under the law. So then why is there bickering? Why is there fighting? Because it all started with unbelief. It all started with us putting ourselves under the law. You see how this is so subtle. I've seen it personally. You can't, first of all, the Bible says it, but I've, I've experienced it personally. I've seen it around other people. I've seen it. You cannot tell me because the minute that we put ourselves, we put a demand upon the flesh. You know what the flesh produces? Though the flesh is circumcised, I'm talking about, uh, that's by faith. But you know what the flesh produces? The flesh produces death. So if I put a demand on the flesh, so for instance, if I squeeze this water bottle, what is going to come out of this water bottle? And there's no cap on it. What's going to come out if I squeeze this water bottle? Water is going to come out because that's what's inside the water bottle. So if you put a demand on this water bottle and you squeeze it, then what's inside will come out. What's inside is water. So water will come out of this water bottle. So you put a demand on the flesh. You know what's inside the flesh? Death. Oh, but we don't believe it. We believe that there's something good in our flesh. So then, okay, so then we put a demand upon the flesh and inside the flesh is what? Death, decay, corruptness. And then we wonder why we're constantly frustrated. So in the same exact manner, the the promise on this, this is the, uh, I don't even want to call it ascension because it sounds so like mystical, but this is the, the growth in Christianity is that we, we, we're going to go from glory to glory, from faith to faith. And it takes us realizing that the promised land as a Christian is called rest. The promised land, inside the promised land. So I want to end with this. Let's say L.A. County, right? We live in L.A. Inside L.A., you have Hollywood. You have Beverly Hills. You have Century City. You have Brentwood. You have Santa Monica. All these beautiful cities. So inside L.A. is all these wonderful cities. Now, spiritually, the land is called rest. Rest. You know, rest county, if you if it helps you. That's that's the land. Inside rest, just like we had cities inside LA, inside this city called or this land called rest, you have cities inside the land called riches, health, peaceful mind, youthfulness, success, whole marriage, great relationships with your kids, great relationships with your spouse, a house multiple houses, multiple cars, whatever it is, the, the, the possibilities are limitless. It's according to your faith. So inside this land, it's like, okay, well, you move to LA. Now go, go to Venice, go to downtown arts district, go to Century City, go to Brentwood, go to Westwood, go to Little Tokyo, go to the Sunset Strip, go to all these areas. It's, it's, you have, you, you're free to roam about the area. You know, when you fly in, in the airplane, you're free to roam about the cabin. You're free to roam about this entire area in the same exact manner. This city called rest, this promised land called rest. You and I will free according to our faith to go in and receive whatever we want to receive. But understand that it is it's always by faith through through grace. It's always by doing something physically, but doing nothing internally. It's by tithing. But we don't tithe out of fear. We tithe from a position of rest, knowing that we have been made rich. Because I'm rich, now I tithe. The Bible says that Melchizedek blessed him who had the promises. We have the promises, but the blessing from Melchizedek comes when Abraham gave a tenth of all. So the, the, the opportunities are endless. The, the opportunity for everything has already been paid for. But it all comes down to resting within. And when we, when we frustrate the grace of God is when we fall from grace is when we begin to look to ourselves. And, you know, 
I'll end with this question that my wife asked me. She said, well, how do you, how, how can someone know, like stop putting a demand upon themselves? Like if someone's asking you, hey, you know, how do I stop being so demand conscious? I mean, as a pastor, as a minister, I would just say it's something that the Lord teaches you. And it's not the easiest answer because it's like, well, you know, I put demands on myself for certain things that the Lord teaches me and, and everyone has their own little kinks and quirks. And that's why, and you know, I think the Lord does that because I am not Jesus. You know, I'm handsome like Jesus. I believe Jesus is handsome, but I'm not Jesus. So I believe he does that because as a minister, I, I all I can do is point you to Jesus. But he wants to talk to you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to teach you and hug you and embrace you. You know, and, and any minister who refuses to point you to the Son of God is not a true minister. So when, when I get asked these questions, a lot of the times it's like there there is no cookie cutter you know, answer, all I can say is, you know, the Lord will help you. The Lord will teach you and show you. I can teach you about grace. I can teach you about the finished work of the cross. I can teach you about the law and grace and all these things. But practically, that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is to apply the knowledge in an everyday life. Practically, you know, you ask the Lord for wisdom and understanding. And he does it this way. You know, I believe that until you ask, you won't receive. And not out of asking out of works. But I believe the Lord does that because it's like, well, it's already done. We understand that. But it takes humility to ask. You know, God has made us free will agents. It, he wants a relationship. He doesn't want, you know, hey, you're saved. Boom, here's all the wisdom. Boom, this is what the law is. Boom, this is what grace is. Boom, this is what faith is. Boom, this is, you know, what you need to stop doing here. Boom, you know, here, actually, I just took care of it. And you're just like a little robot. Just, I, I praise God. Hallelujah. Like, uh, he, he doesn't want that. You know what he wants? He wants, you know, he wants a relationship. He wants you to tell him you're frustrated when you're frustrated. He wants you to cry to him when you don't know what else to say. He wants you to sit still and be in silence when you're just so pissed off at the world. He wants you to just talk to him. Talk to him like a child does to their father, to their loving father. And I, I understand not everyone had a father growing up. And this is why the Lord is, I believe that if that's you, then you have even more grace in this area of sonship. Because where sin increase, grace hyperparisios, grace hyper overflows. So don't, it's not a, a lesser contributing factor, but in reality, it's something to glory in because, because of that weakness, because of that sin. Now, I believe that you specifically, individually, you have more grace to understand the Father's love because you didn't grow up with the Father. Or, be, or because you had a crappy childhood, because you had an abusive father. I believe that now the Lord Himself gives you hyperparisio grace. He gives you hyper overflowing grace above other people to show you what a father is because you had that crappy childhood. So it's not a it's not a disadvantage. In reality, it's an advantage if you can believe right. You know, but at the end of the day, the Lord wants a relationship with us individually. At the end of the day, He wants you to be honest and open with Him. At the end of the day, He wants to help you and do it for you. At the end of the day, He just wants to see you and He wants to hear your voice. He wants to see your face. He wants you to be close to Him. And a lot of times, it will take suffering to soften the soil. I'd be a stupid farmer to plant a seed if the soil was hard and dry. I'd be a stupid farmer if I would pour lots of water if the soil was hard and dried. So, what's to do? <laughs> is that even English? What's to do is to thresh the soil. Soften the soil. 
through suffering. People don't want to hear it. Soften the soil through suffering. Soften the soil through pain. I was listening to, and I promise I'm ending here. I was listening to Daddy Yankee. He was preaching at some, you know, Christian church. And what an awesome guy, man. I really hope I get to meet him. Hopefully I bring him on the podcast and my Spanish will be better by then. But he was telling me, you know, he, he was very successful as, a, as an artist. And something happened where he was on the hospital bed ready to die. And that is when he cried out to the Lord. And he was, he, out of his own testimony, he was saying, well, you know, I build my own life. I build my own tower of Babel. And, I, and no one can, this is what he said. He said, no one can stop me. And the crazy part is because, you know, because when you're called, those gifts are there from birth. And the Lord did not put the sickness on him, but the Lord did allow that to come on him and he used that for his good. The Lord didn't do it to him. The devil did, you know, or different circumstances. He wasn't saved. So the, the bottom line is God didn't do it to him. Though it was allowed, the Lord used it for his good. And what he said was, it wasn't until I was on the hospital bed that I surrendered. And the crazy part is that is the human nature. As a Christian, your mind is programmed to that unless you renew it. It's not until we're metaphorically on our bed, on our deathbed metaphorically, then we say, you know what? Let me listen. Let me read the Bible. Let me hear what this Latino from L.A. has to say. Let me hear what he has to say. Because at the end of the day, if the soil, like I said, is hard, what's the point? What's the point? The soil gets soft through beatings, through threshings. So it's a beauty in the madness, I would say. When, when you realize that, you know what, this self-confidence is being broken, this pride is being broken, but because the soil was so soft right now, any little word, you, you ever been like that? Be, you're going through a hard time and, and you just read one verse and boom, it just penetrates your soul so deeply. Why? Because your heart was ready at that moment. Why? Because you've been so exhausted, because you've been trying, you've been, you've been doing your best. So I'll leave you guys with this, is that this promised land is called rest. And this is where all the blessings reside. Anything you can want is called rest. And it's the opposite of working for it. So this grace message is not a grace message. It's the gospel of grace. This is what the Lord Jesus has come to bring to you and to I. So when we realize that, then we ask the Lord for more wisdom, more understanding, and more grace because we can't even let go within ourselves. We ask Him to let go through us. When you realize you can't even let go, the, hum the humility that comes upon you, like a blanket, but grace is attracted to humility. When you realize you cannot let go, you cannot let go, you can't even surrender, then you cry to the Lord and say, surrender for me. Like a blanket of humility comes upon you. And in that blanket is Hupa Parisio Grace. And I believe that's what the Lord is doing in these last couple of weeks. The last couple of weeks from this year. From everybody who's listening to Truth Podcast. So rejoice and realize that there is greater grace, greater glory, greater wisdom on the other side. Why? Because of the finished work of the cross of Christ. See you in the next one.